Hello, everybody, and welcome to What's This Schematter, the quasi-monthly uh, podcast focusing on all things schema therapy. And I'm here with the sultan of schema, Mr. Robert Brockman, or Dr. Robert Brockman. <laughs> I've got to get it right. Uh, th thanks, Chris. Look, look, and we're also here today with Dr. Eckhart Rodiger, uh, who's in uh, private practice in Frankfurt, Germany, and who's director of the Frankfurt Schema Therapy Institute. Uh, welcome, Eckhart. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast, Eckhart. Nice. I've been, thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. You know, we've been we've been thinking for a long time to get you on, um, partly just to catch up. Um, it's been a long time, been too long actually between catch ups. So um, I'm sorry about that. But uh, also, it's nice. It's nice. So it's nice to see you again. Hope you've been well. Yeah. Hope yeah. you too. Everything been okay over there in Germany? It's getting winter and cold, so <laughs> we get some warm dressing yeah, here. Yeah. Well, you know, we had the idea to to to, to um, get you on board to talk about a few things. And um, often when I talk to you, it's like geeking out about schema therapy. It's an easy thing to do. Um, there's topics like contextual schema therapy that we're both very interested in. Um, at different times, I know you're very involved in uh, schema therapy for couples as well. And and we've had a common interest there at different times. So um, yeah, we got these topics and maybe more today to get through and and sort of would love to hear your perspective and where you're at these days with different things, and to share that also with the listeners, you know, to to understand your perspective. So we're somewhere that's often a nice place to start is just a little bit of like a background type stuff. Um, so I, I wondered if you could share with our listeners a little bit about yourself and your practice over in Germany. And, and in particular, like a bit of a history of how you got into schema uh, over there in Germany and, and how that all got started. Yeah. Um, well, I personally got in touch with schema therapy because based on working with traumat traumatized people, severely complex traumatized people, they perceive themselves as split up in parts of themselves. We know that. And I started working with parts of the self somehow based on uh, Richard Swartz's approach on the internal family system, I think this is the English term. And it's quite similar to, there's a uh, there's a director mode and there are critics some, and, and there are, uh, there's a child part. And a friend of mine who I was talking about, about this way of working, who attended a workshop in 2002 that Jeffrey Lang Young gave in London, and when he came back, he said, Eckhart, what you're doing is schema therapy. And I said, oh, great. I didn't know that so far. And then he gave me the Sarasota Press book from 1990. And I read it and I got impressed by the idea of working with imagery. And then we started in 2002, I started running an inpatient treatment unit in uh, Berlin. And it was actually the worldwide, the first inpatient treatment unit using schema therapy. Mm -hmm. And it went pretty well. And then in 2003, uh, Heinrich Baerbalk uh, had an interview with Jeff Young at the EABCT conference in Copenhagen. And then I, I reached out for, for Heinrich Baerbalk and then uh, we decided that's a good thing to bring schema therapy to Germany. And we invited Jeff Young in 2004 and there was a big rollout with all the CBT training institutes in Germany. And this was the starting point. And uh, Henrik and me, we built up a group of about 12 trainers, which formed the backbone of the present schema therapy institutes in Germany. And we trained people, they started their own institutes, and then not like an avalanche, but a well-growing yeah. thing, it became bigger and bigger. And now in Germany, this is by far the biggest community of schema therapists. Yeah. Worldwide am I, am in the I, ISST, we have 360 hmm. members or something like that. Wow. Am I right to say that it's one of the biggest sort of um, psychotherapeutic approaches, in, you know, compared um, to CBT and uh, well, some other? Where does it sit in, in Germany? Like in this sort of yeah. spread? Uh, that's an interesting question. There's a split between because the scientific community is not very fond of schema therapy. And mm -hmm. I think this has to do with the mode model because this is not very easy to operate if you do research. And on the field of practitioners, it's it's a very famous approach. Clients like it, uh, uh, therapists yeah. working in their private practices like it very much, some clinics like it, but there's a split between the, the scientific world and the, the, the people applying practical scheme, uh, therapy to people. Yeah. And this is one point, we, we might talk about that later. I think we need to be aware that we don't lose the connection with the mainstream of CBT because this is the major thing going on for 60 70 years now 
And those therapies mm. like RET from Albert Ellis, for example, like a star therapy that try to live in their own world in a more yeah. or less self-referential -re system, yeah. they will fade out over the years. And I yeah. think what will last is what we can contribute to the mainstream of evolving CBT. And yeah. this brings us to the point of process-based <laughs> yeah. ideas in schema therapy, because this is my ambition to stay connected with the CBT world, to give yeah. them some impact on how to do uh, uh, um, experiential work. And there we are on the move because imagery, meanwhile, is a an, an CBT technique. CBT uh, uh, therapists use imagery, and they might yeah. also use chairs to split up internal representations and put them on chairs, yeah. which is a brilliant technique. And it's about the relationship because one of our main assets is our more directive, more active, more self-disclosing uh, relationship. And this is what yeah. we can contribute. And so this is my mission to, to get closer, connect so the model with the CBT framework. One of the things that's happened then is that CBT has become more, more schema. Yeah, you can point it that time. way. There's a mutual influence, of course. We, we, oh, of course. Schema therapy, schema therapy grew out of CBT. Jeffrey yeah. Young was one of the major uh, people working at Bax Institute. But there, the, I hope there could be a kickback from schema therapy because we have some brilliant assets in our toolbox and our way of working. We are able to keep clients in therapy. We have low dropout rates. And this is a, this yeah. is a very important thing. And this is based on the relationship, of course. And so we need. I would be very much um, uh, enchanted if we are able to give something back to CBT therapists. But this means they need to understand what we're doing. And for many CBT therapists, and very highly yeah. um, uh, uh, segregated mode model is not attractive because they say this is something like ego states. This is this is not pure scientifically based CBT. That, well, I think that's, a, a that, that's a considerable problem, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think it's a field, as you say, because it is a tricky thing to study. Uh, I'm mm. not sure all of the reasons why it's hard to study. Uh, people like Arnold have done a great job, I think, in in mm. starting that process. Mm. Um, he might be a good model for for that. Like he's managed to publish a lot of studies in the mode model. Um, mm. What well, one of the reasons why it might be a problem, though, that came to mind is. Our field is almost, almost not quite, but almost entirely based upon uh, trait measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, with with modes, we're talking about states, um, so it, it can present as a challenge. But let's, we've, you know, we could talk, talk about this forever. Okay, so, um, okay, we, we, you know, you seem to have um, a lot of, um, you're really focused on uh, developing the 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 scheme of therapy approach uh, within the couple's domain. And this is what we're yeah, aiming at today, really focusing on um, the application of schema therapy for couples. You know, what led you to, to do that? What led you to get involved in that couple's <laughs> field? You know, how did the process yeah. happen? You know, was there... And do you regret it? No, don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I suffer a lot. No, no actually, no, no, that's a good point because schema therapy is about interpersonal relationships it's not meant to treat panic attacks or depression or eating disorders or compulsions it's meant to help people to get along with their relationships in a better way so it's basically innately interpersonal and if you work on the interpersonal relationships with an individual in your individual therapy the easiest thing is to try to keep in mind what will happen with a partner if you change your client, if they change their behavior, this will surely impact the relationship and the partner and he or she will react. So the, it's, 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 it's obvious that you need to anticipate the effects on the relationship. So putting an empty chair for the partner, try and maybe step into their shoes, take a look from their side. How would they feel if Tom now becomes more demanding or more, more assertive or, or more avoidant, more assertive or more demanding for his own space or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is the starting point of working with the relationship in the therapy room. And this is where most of the therapists I know working with couples started from. So we developed, we experienced, Tended the individual approach by adding the partner's perspective. And then you very quickly end up in, in analyzing mode cycles um, um, and looking for techniques how to modify these interactions. 
in real in, in at home for the clients and then pretty quickly i think we started i personally started I, my first push was in 2008 when Travis Atkinson did a uh, workshop in Coimbra where we started the mm-hmm. I, ISST, founded the ISST. And I, I, I was impressed by the idea of using imagery for the couple. Mm-hmm. And then we developed this approach step by step by step. And in 2012, in the New York conference, there was a little rollout. And then um, Chiara Di Francesco approached me and said, hey, we're going to do something about that. And then we, we collaborated with with uh, Bruce Stevens and, and her and had the, uh, the book out in 2015. So it's about seven years now that there is a rough concept. But an important step is we need to, to get away from the storytelling part in couples work. And this is what makes it toxic. And that's the background why you said, hey, are you suffering? You really suffer if you open your therapy room to all this garbage from the past. And what we finally did in the last three, four years is that we built up an approach based on modules, which are steps in therapy, tools you might use to stop maladaptive mode cycles to help people rebalance and we have a simplified model because if you work with couples you can't spend hours on diagnosis on teaching a complex model we condensed the model got away from all these different modes we ended up with what is emotionally happening in your body which is the schema activation part we feel the schema activations in our body reactions and then we have voices in the head representing the beliefs that we learned. We call it parent mode or critic modes. We yeah. call it just the, 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 the critic voices in the head. And we have the display behavior. So we have just the three components all CBT people are familiar with. Emotions in the body, voices in the head, and behavior. And if you focus on these parts, and then you can put all the modes in, in, in all, all the coping modes in a spectrum between more internalizing behavior connected with more anxious, vulnerable, basic emotions or child modes and the need for attachment. This is one trajectory. This is what we call the blue leg, going for connection, willing to compromise, maybe submit with the risk that you lose, get away from the other leg, which is your 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 need for assertiveness, control, autonomy, connected with the power of anger, cre- uh, constructive anger power in your body to make your stand, which is related with the sympathetic autonomous nervous system and enables you to make your point up to dominate and fight with other people. And this is the red leg. So we just have these two trajectories, internalizing, externalizing. And if both doesn't work, people withdraw, which is the third option. And this is basically the fight, flight, freeze, and surrender model from the animal model. But you don't need all these modes. It's just a very simplified thing with two legs. Are you more on the assertive side, more pushing people? Are you more on the blue blue leg over engaged and maybe not making your point and becoming a victim in the relationship mm-hmm. so and this is a simple are, victim polarity yeah your couples are um responding well to this kind of simplified conceptualization extremely well extremely well because this color coding with blue and red mm-hmm. is neutral mm-hmm. there are mm-hmm. no maladaptive associations blue is not better than red and uh, yeah. vice versa it's a, it's a simple neutral descriptive model and people in the second session use red and blue. So this is very helpful. And you don't need more education. And you can deliver it in one session. That's the, that's the trick. And then you have the framework. And you can constantly, sorry, Chris, you can constantly stop the couple, stop the interaction, stand up. That's what we do to get in an observer perspective. We stand up and say, hey, hey, mates, which leg is Tom on or which leg is Betty on? Yeah. yeah. So this is Betty, this is Tom. And stopping the interaction, going to observer mode, gives you Mm -hmm. time, space, gives Mm -hmm. you and them a break. Then you can ask them, yeah, okay, if Betty's on the red leg, what will Tom do? What is the expected response and what is the actual response? And you can modify the cycle and you can quickly come back to the needs. What does Mm -hmm. Betty really need? Yeah. yeah, yeah. she's angry, but she wants connection. I said, okay, but if she pushes Tom and he turns away, is that a good idea? If so she just, wants just as a listener, maybe go another way. Carly yeah. Eckhart is um, yeah. standing with a life-size teddy bear and gesturing yeah. with the teddy bear just in case you, yeah. just, you yeah. can't see yeah. that. We but might have to post this as a video at some stage. But that was awesome. I, I, was, I guess when we were organizing this um, catch-up, 
it, it, obviously there's the, there's couples work and we some of us do couples work and routinely do this but i get the, guess that there is a lot of conceptual material here that can be applied to any any therapist doing schema therapy as well so yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. that's the have you got any comment yeah. on on so that too there there's a merge mm -hmm. because Working with couples forces you to focus on the real essential steps. You can't waste time with, with, with narratives, with storytelling. It's not working. Because when, when you allow the couple to tell their stories in the therapy room, there will be no match. You know, It's like with the smartphone metaphor on the website. We have these, the, the explanation of the model is on the website, schematherapy-rudiger.org. This is the website. Beautiful. There's yeah. all the training tutorials on the materials, resources, videos. You can get the tutorials about the model and about the smartphone metaphor because the couple is like watching two sides of the smartphone. They live in different worlds. And if you spend time on sharing the different worlds, they will not agree. So we look on the interaction with the simplified model on the interaction in the room, because that's what we all see. And then you try to get away from the storytelling, analyze the maladaptive interaction pattern, modify it to a more need fulfilling interaction. This is our focus. And if you realize how well that works, this gives you a kickback to individual therapy. And you get away from all the storytelling. You go back to imagery because imagery connects you with the schema building situations. This is the true uh, story, t uh, history taking or biographical history taking is going to imagery and going back to the schemas that are connected with the present moment symptoms. So we don't go to all this storytelling. We try to get an overview, contextual view, standing up position. What is the state now, present moment? Where do you want to go? This is good focus in individual therapy too. And we go to imagery work to understand what is driving us. Where are the schemas impacting my perceptions, my feelings, my impulses right now? And then we go back to observer position. Hey, okay, that's your schemas. That's what you feel in your body, what your mind, voice in the head tells you. Is that helpful? Where do you want to go? And there's a lot of influence from acceptance and commitment therapy. And that's something we share, Rob, yeah. we both see there's a lot act can contribute to schema work because it balances the more experiential part of schema therapy with the more goal-directed metacognitive perspective helping you out of this enmeshed fused thinkings in all yeah. your narratives that entangle you with your past and there is no future if you get stuck in your past stories yeah. you need to make a break and look at the present moment where do you want to go so and part of is, that, I can way. see you getting the client's healthy adult online, like yeah. at different points and getting mm -hmm. out of more mode driven, you know, maladaptive mode driven narratives, exactly. behaviors. Yeah. What, what, what are some of the, I mean, getting more into this and de developing the model and getting involved in schema therapy with the couples, what have been some of the bigger, I guess we can, it's a broad question, challenges in doing mm -hmm. that? And also maybe if you can touch on any opportunities. Yeah, I can pick up the thread I already laid out. The main problem is that you need to guide the process in the therapy room very tightly. You need to put the clients on a lead to guide them through the process. If you give them too much space, they flood you with their internal perspectives, with their stories. So we need to stop this storytelling. I'm, re I'm repeating myself a little bit and yeah. focus on what mode are you in right now? Which leg are you on in our two leg model? What is the impact? Is that what you need? Standing up position. If you look at your whole personality, okay, there's a need for assertiveness and this drives you into fighting. But at the end of the day, what is the purpose of your relationship? Is it fighting with each other? No, we basically want to be connected in a peaceful way in a parasympathetic, a vagal parasympathetic social engagement state, according to Polk's theory. So we need to go there. So anger is okay, put it aside. Step out, go into timeout, balance yourself. Where do you want to go? And this is where we need to guide these people to. And this means balancing as a therapist, balancing, guiding them, with connection, with validation, with showing compassion for their state, but take them away and said, hey, do you feel good with that? No, if you don't feel good, we need to try something different. Our listeners can't something. see 
you yeah. at the moment, right? But I can see, you know, you're very big on gesticulating and your use of <laughs> bodily positioning and jumping up with the teddy bear. And is this is this something that's coming into your therapy as well? I mean, are you very yes. explicit about positioning and use of the body? Yes, exactly. This is a new development that we understand the body is part of ourselves. There is no mind without body reactions. And the body postures, the body states impact your mental uh, activations. So we think in terms of neural networks in our brain and feeling stressed, feeling getting angry um, it, or getting into a schema activation of trauma flashback is a certain activation of one network in your brain. It's almost like bottom-up processing. Did you say it? Like this is a bottom-up yeah. processing, exactly, Chris. And this impacts our uh, our experiencing a lot because we are constantly triggered and our brain is always offering something. And what we need to do is to get aware, to, to, to use our choices because we have multiple networks in our brain. And I think there's always a healthy adult network with each client, even if it's a severe trauma client, if it's a dissociated identity disorder client, they are able to drive cars, to, to, to yell at their children, to do some work, to pay taxes and whatever. And they, they, there is a functioning a person. And we should not disregard this part and make it an active co-therapist in therapy. Even if a client is driven by a flashback, he's in a schema activation. It's just one network. And if we stand up, put the network, in quotations, on the chair and said, okay, now we're observing. Get back to your body. Take a deep breath. Do some skills. Being in the present moment. Okay, how do you feel now? Now it's okay. Is there something yeah. wrong with the two of us in the room? No, that's okay now. That's a safe space here in our therapy room. Okay, based on this perspective, what could we do now? Get into your resource network. And you could call it positive schemas. This was one of the questions you mentioned. You could call it positive schemas. You can call it a resource network. You can call it the healthy adult mode. That's, yeah. that's what it takes. So we are only just realizing this in schema, um, the, the, the body focus. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's there in a way in, in, in a lot of the techniques. And, you know, can we, can we connect to that feeling in your body and, and you mm -hmm. know, different sort of things? But we haven't been so explicit about it. And other therapies uh, have been focusing on the body, of course. Um, I think we haven't quite realized that all the way. And mm. right. And uh, bo bodily sensations are clearly a part of schema activation. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. We're on the same page because, but in both directions, body experiencing with eyes closed and the imagery state brings us to the schemas. Because schema activations is what impacts and distorts our present moment awareness. That's the problem. The problem is not in the present moment to a large extent. It's the schemas connecting us or, or draw, uh, dragging us back into childlike yeah. perspectives, putting us the schema child glasses on. Yeah. Once we get into the contextual adult view, things look better. We can do much more. We have options. We have choices. So the body is the gateway to the schemas if you close eyes and connect with it so focusing on the body feeling in the connects with the episodic memory stuff and takes you away from the semantic processing where just the narratives and stories are laid out this is one side on the other hand if you stand up change your body posture go into a joint perspective put all the internal problems out on the chairs the change of the body posture brings you more to your healthy adult state so into both directions, you can use body activations to go deeper into the schema activations or get out of them by changing, taking a body posture, which is, which is in contradiction to the schema experiencing in your body. And so taking a metacognitive view. Both ends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, now, you can move around in the room, for example. If you just move some, in a standing up position, you can move in your room. And moving in your room is a contradiction to being trapped in a corner when you're a beaten up child. Yeah. So this is another, this activates mm. bottom Experiencing up freedom. On a healthy way. Yeah. yeah. I know Jeff, um, Jeff Young, you know, I remember going to a workshop or, you know, maybe in a supervision group I was involved with at one point. He made the, the point of saying that a healthy relationship and helping a client to enter into healthy relationships is really pivotal to healing schemas. Mm -hmm. 
you know, yeah. I don't know about you, but you know, you see some relationships seemingly, you, you know, you think, oh, how does that work? I mean, even if we've got friends and family, where you're like, mm, does that yeah. this, this somehow works? You know, whatever they seem happy, um, you know, despite challenges and these sorts of things. Um, but you know, within a scheme of therapy perspective, are there any requirements for a healthy, fulfilling relationship? Well, well, I think I'm 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 in the relationship with my wife now for 39 years, so that's a pretty long time. And I know many people who are in, uh, in relationships who go over decades. So, I think the miracle or the mystery or the, the pivotal point in managing your relationship is a good balancing. This brings us back to the blue and red leg model, the two leg model, because in a in in a mature relationship, it's always a compromise between connecting sharing things, going together, and giving some distance, doing things on your own. And if you manage to balance connection and distance or connection and autonomy, this gives you space for both sides. You can enjoy your, your need for um, um, attachment and connection and, and closeness when it works well. And whenever it gets difficult, stop fighting. Don't argue with the other person. Just step back. Go on parallel tracks, everybody does his own stuff. And when you distance and live your autonomy side, your assertive side, the need for connection grows because it's getting colder out there. It's like with the hedgehogs, you know? If hedgehogs try to hug each other, it's getting itchy. <laughs> and then they need to get away. <laughs> when they get away, it gets cold. So they try to get closer. And so it's about a good balance. And this is the secret or mystery about a good relationship that you don't expect too much. That you realize we are on different pages of the on different sides of the smartphone we need to work for connection and if it's working it's fine there are moments of harmony of going together of being in resonance but we are different people with different minds and different histories so whenever it gets difficult the problem begins when we try to change the other person mm -hmm. and that's the problem when couple comes to therapy both think fix the other one he's or she's the problem and we say hey the problem is the mode cycle you can clap with one hand. So even if you don't do much, if you just hold your hand against the mm. clapping hand of your partner, you contribute. Mm. Even a detached person contributes. So that's the problem is the cycle. So if you stop getting on your red leg, if you stop pushing the other person, this is the most important part. Stop that, go into timeout, mm. get, get, get away, try to balance, and then try to make the best out of it. This is yeah. what it takes. You know, like related to this, there there is this idea in schema that, um, especially maybe for the for the uh, BPD clients mm -hmm. or clients with attachment problems, which can be many of them, of course, mm -hmm. that our job's not necessarily quite done until they are in a healthy relationship or a health, you know, experience healthy connection, healthy attachments. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's your view on that? Because it can feel sometimes like we, you know, we, we're really advocating for, you know the need for relationships. What do you think of that? Well, being in a relationship is our attachment side, our attachment need. We are pr social group building animals or species. So the connecting with other people was a matter, a matter to survive. So this is inbuilt in our biological program that we long for connection, that we not knowing, but feeling unconsciously deep in our body, we need the other people. So this is one side. This is our blue leg side. We try to connect with other people, more or less. And on the other side, we, we have the need for autonomy. We want to develop ourselves. And this is the part when a borderline client gets overly uh, demanding, pushing, controlling, blaming, because they try to get their individual self-centered needs met. And borderlines sometimes are, are torn between the strong need to to soothe their own pain with another person. Because this is basically the, the child mother or child father reunion that the baby experiences himself as not able to care for him or herself. They yep. need another person, definitely. Yep. And when we grow up, there is a, the network, the self-soothing network, the network that helps us to stand emotions as a tra transitory network activations. The Buddhists say all feelings come and go, nothing less. So taken in metacognitive perspective and regard your emotions as something that comes and goes, and on the other side, regard your beliefs as a suggestion to your brain that you might think or not, 
So finally, there is something inside yourself which is just observing all the coming and going uh, states of your body, of your mind, of your emotions, of your thoughts. This is help. what helps actually helps borderline clients a lot to develop a sense of a being mode and get out of this doing mode. This is essential for, for DBT, for example. And I think they're right. So the key problem is that the borderline clients need to discover or need to distance or detach from their intensive emotional states and persist them as coming and going waves. And they are the cork which is lifted uh, with the emotions, but the persistent part is the cork, not the wave. Mm. So this is something that we need to teach clients. If you don't take the care of your vulnerable side, your child mode, if you think there's an, there needs to be another person, what's the child perspective, of course, but if you still as an adult person think you need to look for another person caring for your vulnerable side, you will get dependent from this other person. Yeah. And if this other person kicks your vulnerable child from the lab, you will be uh, lost again. So don't rely that much on other people. Rely on yourself. So this is part of the therapy to create an acceptance for the remaining pain, the remaining yeah. negative emotions, and don't fix them. Don't expect that they can be fixed. And this is relevant for therapists and clients. Because yeah. I think schema therapists are over-engaged by the idea to heal schemas, to create a, a, a good state, uh, uh, to make borderline clients like other people or severe trauma clients like other people. But this is not possible because their networks are distorted. We need to tell clients, hey, you are different. You're starting from a different point than other people. Don't compare yourself with other people. You have your life. You have unfortunate life conditions. You have hardships to face. And you do a brilliant job dealing with that. But don't expect being normal, in quotations. You are different. And I can help you to accept being different and make the best out of it. This is basically DBT. This and follows this on from, from the, and, and the next question really is focusing on therapist's own views or schemas. I mean, personally, for my for myself, I remember, you know, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was doing accreditation myself, um, I was going through a bit of a, a period with a, a particular client with a dysfunctional relationship. And it, and it did, at the time, bring up a fair bit of stuff for myself and my own views and values within relationships at the time. And, you know, what do you think, the, you know, the influence of therapist's own sort of views and, and biases are um you know on on treatment you know for for relationships yeah if we look at the schemas of therapists and we know what the schemas of therapists are we are most of us are wounded children lost children abandonment issues sometimes um 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 assertiveness issues in terms of being ashamed or making incompetent and of course we learn to deal with that in a more or less compensatory way we be, we went to the other side of the needle, <laughs> we try to be on the on the on the sunny side of the street and become experts in dealing with with problems. But we ha still have the schemas, and we have the unrelenting standard schemas, and we have the the self sacrifice schema. And this makes us very vulnerable to kind of a parentified child behavior. We are over engaged to think we need to save and rescue all the clients. And then we take a very active role. We do a lot of reparenting. We think we must fix it. And I think this is not the best stance. Of course, the client need nurturing, needs affirmation, needs validation. But we try from the very start to yeah. integrate the healthy adult part of the client and don't make them smaller as they are. And in say, terms okay, of you have staying problems. together versus separating, do you, can, can you comment on that? Because I, I mean, for me, it was more, I've come from a family where, you know, my parents have been married for 60 years and, you know, and yeah. this idea of staying together, giving it a go rather than, it was a bit of a revelation at the time to kind of think, well, maybe it's better to separate. It's a, it's a better outcome. It depends. It right. depends, yeah. Chris. What we yeah. do in couples therapy, and also I would do it as well in an individual therapy, we try to analyze where's the gain, where's the pain. So mm -hmm. what did you actually gain in the present moment from this relationship? And what do you what is the price you pay? Yeah. So there's 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 Gottman data which tells us the negative interaction must become dominant towards the positive interaction unless couples separate. But the problem is some people get stuck in 
toxic relationships and this is the problem and then we might need to uh, to support the assertive side the autonomy side and say hey care for yourself first mm -hmm. this is especially for over engaged enmeshed people who got stuck on their attachment leg and think i can't do it on my own i need to make it going i have to pay the price for everything mm -hmm. this is not sane they're not balanced and then it's better to stop mm -hmm. a relationship or maybe get into more distance it's not always about a, a, a highway to hell or, or a stairway to heaven. It's, usually it's in between. Uh, it's yeah. a gray zone. There are 50 shades of gray in our relationships. And we can go to a lighter gray zone, getting out of a dark gray zone by getting more distance from the partner. And this is where, where I meant that point already. Mm -hmm. This is the most important outcome in couples work is it's not about getting happy ever, ever after and not about this is the hell. The problem is if you get into a more distant relationship, in an arranged relationship, we call it living together apart, you're sometimes together and sometimes apart. This is the key to balance. And this gives you a lot of space to navigate between being happy or, or, or separating. It's, so some of this too, if you think about like attachment theory, Eckhart, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a bit like horses for courses. Like mm -hmm. so... You know, there are there are some clients who, if if they have let's say a more uh, avoidant attachment style, that they don't they really don't like co-regulation. They're mm -hmm. really not interested to to in a way to connect, or their approach has been to distance. And mm -hmm. so, it may be useful to teach them how to connect, or or that it's okay to get support from other people, or to to engage in co-regulation. Like this, yeah. this is a kind of normal part of being a human being. There are times in life when it's it's useful to engage a social network to help regulate. And so for mm -hmm. those guys, we might push more to connect. And then the, those other clients, let's say if they are more anxiously attached, who this is what you're, I'm getting from what you're saying, we have to teach them also that ultimately we have to learn how to self-regulate as well. Yeah. And and we exactly. can't overwhelm our networks. Yeah. And then I would see the, the sort of healthy attachment as, as being able to balance this. Exactly. Knowing those moments when it's good to reach out and it's good to access support in our networks and those moments when maybe it's good to do it on our own as well. Yeah. I think that's you made the point already, <laughs> giving the answer in your own question, because it's about balancing and it's about flexibility. And sometimes those people who are in a detached uh, attachment style, they usually got frustrated in their attempts to reach with other, reach out to other people. And this is what we see in the Still Face video tutorial, that the child first tries to connect with the mother in a nice way, then doing it the hard way by yelling at her. And at the end, she, she tries to connect the cameraman and finally ends up in a frustrated, detached state. So, and this is what Atronic calls the ugly way because people need connection. So detached um, attachment style is the, the bad solution because we end up in a moral, and it's very closely related to depression and other psycho uh, psychic disorders. So what do we need to teach the client? And this is part of the comment you made. They need both skills. They are like a a, a trash tin boy box. They are they are they are uh, uh, shrink together. What we need is <laughs> or like like a snail to to motivate to get out of of, of their their shell or their house. They need to try both. They need to trust people again carefully and say, okay, give it a try. Approach people. Ask people. Go out. Make make uh, encounter people. Go maybe to Tinder or whatever uh, 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 relationship accounts <laughs> and try to go out for connection. But don't expect everything is working well. Then if they don't treat you well, make your point, say goodbye and say, no, that's not my cup of tea. Because this is the other two poles. When once you are aware and we, we give the client the experience that they can't check out, they can't say no, they can't uh, stop an, an interaction. This gives them, this is the autonomy side, the red side. If we teach them to be more assertive in role plays, for example, yeah. they are safe enough to trust a little bit. And once they trust, they might get a good experience. If, if not, go back to your assertive side and step out, give another try. It's about the rhythm of uh, reaching out and going back or the metaphor we use for detached clients is the detached protector is like like a wall it's protecting you against the bad world outside but it's not only a bad world outside there's something to experience 
So we use the city wall metaphor, which is on one side protecting you against the bad people outside, the enemies. But there's a big city gate in the wall with a healthy adult mode on it, deciding when is it's time to open the door to connect with people. This is the, the, the connection attachment side. And whenever it's getting unsafe, go back, close the door, and then the door becomes a part of the wall. And then you're safe again. So you can combine safety and the, the, the possibility for connection in a good way. And these metaphors might help people to, mm. to get more motivated, to give it a try, become more flexible. Perfect. But they will only trust when they feel safe enough. So they need yeah. their assertive side to, to, to care for themselves, protect themselves, ask for something, demand. But they also need to give something, to offer something. Because a good relationship is about asking, demanding, and offering in a good balance. And this is what we teach the detached clients. So this is, well, I'm tempted to say this is love, but this, this segues to our next question. What, what do you, the concept of love, mm-hmm. falling what in love, love? There's also what songs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a nice sign that it must be somehow important, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what is this? What is this from a schema point of view? How do we conceptualize the concept of love? Is When I think about this, I, I sort of think about it as a set of needs and and maybe uh, certain needs being met, you know, as maybe being underpinning love or the, the feeling of love. But what do you think? What? How do you think about yeah. this? Well, first of all, love is a four-letter word. That's what we learned from Tina Turner. <laughs> and no, I think, uh, let me make a, um, um, a provocative point. I think love is a body function to make us attached to other people. And this is what you can see in the slow face video. Now, we are born with the attachment need to form groups because the group is surviving. The individual gets killed by the uh, tiger. And That's the not very romantic. I, to catch- I know. And this, <laughs> I, I said, I announced that. It's a provocative point. But... The interesting part is if you watch the tutorial on the website about the still face video, there are two points where I stop. And the point is when the child reaches out in a vulnerable way, the child shows its vulnerable side and the mother is not reacting. And then I stop there and I ask, hey, what as an observer do you feel right now? And every, literally every observer, maybe some despite some autists or antisocials or psychopaths, they feel compassion for this vulnerable child. Because this is a biological program. Uh, Jak Pangsep calls it the caretaking system as one, the active part of the attachment relationship. And what we need to learn is and need to teach our clients, trust showing vulnerability again. Because when you dare to show vulnerability, the chance that the caretaking system on the, in the other person gets activated is very high. Much higher as if you show an assertive demanding stance. Oh, yeah. and, and, the, and this is working with everybody. Everybody feels this, oh, I need to care for this child. And it's a video. It's 30 years old. We don't know this girl. But our attachment system, our caretaking part is triggered in everybody. And this is not an ethical or moral thing. This is a biological thing. And what we'll so do, we'll, we'll put the video up um, in the notes, in the show notes, so people can watch this. Yeah. It's the Ed Tonic video, the still face experiment, mm-hmm. if you're mm-hmm. looking at that. Not so the experiment. No. You need the tutorial from oh, our Oh, the website. tutorial. Okay. So there's it's a 31-minute tutorial yeah. about a 1-minute, 48-second yeah. video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the point. Yeah. So yeah. You bring but up I can send you the link. Really important, okay. Eckhart. And maybe this would end up, we're going to go close to finishing with this question, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, and you talked about imagery of scripting before, and I thought it might be nice to finish with a sort of practical overview of like, how does something like imagery rescripting look in a couple's context? The, the, the triggering part in imagery for couples is we go like an individual therapy. We use the, tr- no, not exactly like an individual therapy. In a couple's therapy, you can start with a triggering clash situation. What triggered me in the partner? That made me drove me crazy yesterday evening, yeah, yeah, because the toothpaste was still in the sink, you know, yep, yep. And we yep. start with that point, and then we go to the body, to the emotions, the body feelings. We float back, and we end up with the mother bossing the child all the time, yep. yeah. Of one party, let's say, let's say, let's say, only one party, only one party. Yeah, okay, whoever, so you're it doesn't with matter. Okay. We do, we do it vice versa. So that's we a float back. partners based on a on a, on a that's relational the float back. Exactly, and then we stop. And then the partner comes in uh, because usually the expressed vulnerability of the partner, the child state, 
schema st activation state of the partner triggers the caretaking system in the observing partner, as I just mentioned before. And then driven by his caretaking system, they care for the partner. And then we have a brilliant outcome because the partner who first in the clash drive them, drove them crazy now is the healing partner. And they perceive the partner in a healthy, adult, caring way. Yeah. And then usually in more than half of the sessions, the caring partner says, I don't want to be like your mom. Yeah. yeah. And they realize the Just, link. They realize the link. Explicitly yeah, exactly. Now. Yeah. And they realize two things. They realize what is the actual source of their activation. It's not the partner. The partner is just the trigger. The source or the cause is the schema. And yeah. this helps the client to separate the trigger from the, from the, from mm -hmm. the schema on one side. And the other side is they perceive the partner, hey, this can be a helpful person. This is not he or she is a big moment like too, Eckhart. It's a big moment. I, it's I exactly. If, if you get to this stage where the partner is able to do this, because you know it's it's that moment in every relationship where the client is or, or, or the person is sharing that that vulnerability with the other person, yeah. and then if that vulnerability is cared for, yeah, right, then, that's a healing then, moment. Would well, you see that as them reparenting or you know quasi reparenting each other? Is that how you would say? Uh, yeah, it? I would call yeah. it just a caring. It's yeah. caring. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a, corrective it's a good, healthy connection. It's a caring situation. And since it's done on both sides, it's mm. mutual. Yeah. So they both perceive their partner as caring. And the interesting part is they realize there is a certain chemistry because usually the partner is a little bit like father or mother yeah. because we are accustomed to this pattern. But there's also another part in my partner which is helpful, which is present moment, which is which is open for, for growth. But and this is what we might need to guide the attention to where can you grow together where can you get out of your schema activations which entangles you into the past and where can you make use of the good parts of your partner the healthy part of your partner and grow into a is better this, is this a, sometimes i think is a sort of wish here right though for people that our our relationships will heal us mm -hmm. of course like an There's expectation it. sometimes it's yeah. unrealistic maybe but there's a sort of pressure on the partner to, to, you know, I never had this. I never had stability. I never had, or I was always the one who had to be responsible. So now I wish that you'd take care of it. Yeah, but it, it's the balance. It's if you open up, if you show vulnerability, if you give your partner a chance to do better than you experienced in the past, this corrects your schema or this adds something and uh, helpful or, or um, um, emotional experience. A corrective emotional experience and this is the healing part in a relationship but it also depends that you don't expect that everybody everything is done by your partner you also need to work on yourself it's balancing right. again yeah. once more is balancing and we often and it's about mutuality both need to we, be caring and showing vulnerability we often end up in that place anyway in schema right where, where we're saying hey um, as much I can easily see that this situation is triggering for you, and actually maybe it would trigger anybody, yeah, right? Because it's not too cool what's happening here. At yeah. the same time, this thing is pushing your buttons too, in ways yeah. that represent your your history and your and your past and, yeah. and your schemas. So we end up in this kind of place of like fifty fifty. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I I think we're gonna have to separate soon. Because we've been here yep. talking for 45 yep. minutes and it's been a lovely <laughs> chat. <laughs> Loved it. Yeah, it was intense. Right. It's, Thank look, you. it's always intense question. with you, Eckhart, when we talk about schema. We kind of get right in there, but it's lovely seeing you again, mate. And we, we're, we're looking forward to possibly working with you in the next couple of months with a possible you know, yeah. online course. We have a webinar. Yeah, we have a webinar, webinar. coming up, a two-hour yeah. webinar. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go more into the blue and the green and the red and all the things Eckhart's been talking about. All the colors of the rainbow that sort of... <laughs> Schema therapy for couples. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll post that up soon and you can see about that. Eckhart, was there any um, anything you wanted to plug, mate, um, about what you're doing at the moment? Well, that's what we talked about. I'm working with couples. I'm trying to work towards the, what are the key processes in schema therapy, which are really essential and that we might contribute to the evolving stream of CBT. And it's um, about getting a more comprehensive schema therapy, adding act, acting the body work, and, and make it a very comprehensive, open, flexible, but in the same time, 
manageable, simple model. So this is this is my mission. This is the challenge. Um, yeah, and uh, there's some years to go. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Are you Are you going to come to Melbourne um, this year? Uh, next yes, year, we, I will. You're going to be in yes. Melbourne. Ooh, yeah. Right. All right. I got an invitation. Right. Oh, I heard about it. Perfect. What are you going to present? Yeah. About contextual schema therapy. So one day workshop Perfect. on contextual work. Doing so all this standing up, body stuff, imagery, positions. Yeah. Can't so wait. just Can't just wait. to promote that, um, for those that are listening, so it's the um what was the summer school, uh, which is called Enlight 2023 Melbourne. It's, uh, it's yeah. run by the International Society of Schema Therapy. It's a collection of um um short um you know, seminars, uh, it's less of a conference, mm. but more of a school based um, get together. And a lot of workshops. It's more BM... based on workshops, actually. Yeah. yeah it's but some lectures yeah. as well. So yeah. it's, it's a mix. And it's the 16th, 17th, and 18th uh, from memory of March 2023. So um, just to plug that, and you might want to look at the international. And it will be online and in person. It's yeah, also online. So you oh, don't okay. need to go there. Physically, oh, but it's better. Yeah. Checking on. So if you're in Australia, it's better course, to go in person, of course. You can have, to person, have some Vegemite with us, and yeah. you know, we can tell you some Aussie words and things like that. All right, and and so I'll see you. We'll see you in Melbourne, Eckhart. Uh, it's been lovely right. catching yeah. up with you. Um, and of course, we hope that you make the fortieth year by then. I want to get the feedback that you've made forty yeah. years of marriage. Fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> we work okay, hard. On we that. can have a party. The on outlook that. is good. The outlook is good. <laughs> Thanks. You made again, it this far. You made it this far. Thanks okay. again for coming. And yeah. um, if you're interested further in um, looking at uh, some courses or anything to do with schema therapy, you might want to look at our website, uh, www.schemotherapytrainingonline.com. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. It was, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, yeah, yeah. see you guys. Okay.